You'll notice that we had over 80 kids on campus this last week joining us for Vacation Bible School. It was a joy. It was tiring. But I believe that God was honored through this week. Uh, Thank you so much. I hear it in my head again. I don't know if y'all hear it. Oh, there we go. I'm not hearing it either. Um, uh, that uh, God was honored. We, we really appreciate um, each and every person that took part in helping out this week. Um, it's not over. You'll see we're not undecorated yet. So um, your Father's Day gift, those of you that are here, is to help take down the decoration a little bit later on in our, uh, in our day. Uh, we are in the middle of a, uh, actually we're at the very start of the summer, and I, I like to do some fun things over the summer musically. One of those things is uh, we're going to do this summer is we're going to highlight some authors of some of uh, the songs that we hold dearly in our faith. And today we're kind of a juxtaposition between um, a classic hymn writer and somebody who is currently putting out things on the the radio. Uh, And I want to introduce you to those early on here. We'll see if if you can figure out who wrote what, okay? (laughs) Um, so first, uh, hymn writer Fanny Crosby, I'm sure you've heard much about her uh, throughout the years, uh, or maybe little snippets, um, but uh, she was a very prolific uh, te- hymn text writer. Po- poetry was her forte uh, of the 19th century, uh, wrote over 9,000 hymn texts. Um, she was a friend of several U.S. presidents. A political activist and was very involved in the local missions. She was kind of um, the Annie Armstrong of, uh, of New York State, uh, from what I gathered. She was very active in her local uh, mission, and some of her hymn texts reflect that. Um, hymns such as, let's see, where's one of those that's, um, oh yeah, Rescue the Perishing is probably one of those that, that you'll, you'll recognize as one that's really reflecting that local uh, mission flavor. Um, you know, she was paid one to two dollars per hymn text. That was kind of her, what she was paid back then. Um, copyright rules didn't really protect the author too terribly much, so the people who wrote the music made all the money uh, doing what they do. And she wrote the text and made a dollar or two per hymn. Uh, but she just enjoyed doing what she did, and even the dollar or two she made, she gave away most of it, um, based on what we know of her. Um, She was very highly involved in the um, Methodist uh, revival meeting uh, movement and and was a primary uh, text writer for Ira Sankey and D.L. Moody's uh, hymn uh, revivals that they did around the U.S. Uh, Some of the songs she gave us, uh, we'll sing a couple today, but uh, a few today, but uh, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, Blessed Assurance, Praise Him, Praise Him, Rescue the Perishing, To God Be the Glory, Give me Jesus, and we could go on. There's many others. Uh, the other artist we're going to, to highlight a bit today is Cody Carnes. So he's uh, writing music now and has been active for the last 10 or so years doing so. He's a product of Gateway Worship out of the Dallas area, um, and he was a worship pastor on their staff for quite a while. He is married to another prominent uh, music writer, Carrie Job. Um, between them, they have uh, quite a few uh, great uh, songs that you'll hear on the radio. Uh, some of the ones uh, that you've probably heard recently, Run to the Father, Nothing Else, The Blessing, right when the pandemic hit, they wrote The Blessing and, and released that. Uh, and it, it was kind of a just the, what people needed to hear, I think, at the time. Firm Foundation, which we sing here, and we're going we're gonna to sing a couple uh, new songs of, of his. One is Christ Be Magnified, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And the other we're going to stand and sing now is Take You at Your Word. Let's stand together as we sing together.
is everybody? I heard some greats. I heard some... <laughs> I heard some I'm tired. I've heard some I'm hot. But uh, it's great. I'm grateful to see all of you this morning. Thank you. No matter what you're going through, it could be up, you could be down today. Um, no matter what you're going through, we're grateful that you're here today worshiping, not only in this space, but we also have people joining us online uh, on Facebook Live, and we're grateful that we have this time to get together and worship as a body of believers. If you're new here or a guest, we certainly welcome you, and uh, there's some uh, visitor cards in front of you and the Bible rack there. Please fill that out as best you can. 
put that on the uh, offering plate when it comes by a little bit later on in the surface service. There's also places on those cards where you can fill in a prayer request, and you don't have to be a guest to do it. You can be anybody uh, to do that and to fill that out. In fact, this is a cool thing that came out of Vacation Bible School this week. Um, I'm not going to give you a name because uh, I want to protect privacy here, but I looked in the uh, prayer request box very early this morning when I got here, and there was a, a, a nine-year-old who I think at Vacation Bible School filled out one of these cards. Wasn't asked to do that, just did it. Uh, put his name, his age, and also his phone number on there and asked on the back, he said uh, he would like us to pray for his friends and family. The nine-year-old kid. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So um, yeah, so you, you don't have to be nine years old. Uh, you can be any age. You can fill these out and put them in uh, the prayer request box uh, as well. We also want to say happy Father's Day to everybody who's celebrating uh, this morning. And for those who may not be biological dads, but you're certainly spiritual dads to people. Uh, we have a special video actually for you coming up a little bit later in the service. Would you pray with me? God, we say thank you. We're grateful this morning for the ups, the downs, the in-betweens. We're grateful this morning that uh, we have an opportunity not only to celebrate dads and father figures who've meant so much to us over the years, but Lord, it's a, a great privilege to celebrate the fact that you are our heavenly father. And Lord, that you found it so gravely important to come be one of us to die for us on the cross, to conquer death and the grave, and to open the way for our freedom. Freedom of our souls to be reconciled with you and with our neighbor. So Lord, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving. We also, Lord, pray a prayer of intercession this morning for even little kids who want us to pray for their families and friends. Lord, we pray for the not-so-little kids who need us to pray for their families and friends this morning. We pray for our church as well, that you would give us great encouragement in this time of worship, as this time is, a, is, is an hour that we can disconnect from all the noise be present with you because you're present with us and hear from you. Help us to do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. John. Stand together. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So
song that we're singing, Christ Be Magnified, to me was a really great picture of what we learned at Vacation Bible School this week, that if we wouldn't praise God, the rocks would cry out and praise Him, and that we are called to join uh, all of humanity, all creation, in shining Jesus' light through praising Him. We're creation, suddenly articulate in the thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be
at this time in our reading of scripture. Good morning. Sorry. I'm going to be reading today from Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. What a beautiful verse. Let, me, let us pray. Father, we thank you that you can provide strength to us when we're tired. You can provide strength to us when we're weak and when we stumble and fall, literally and figuratively. We thank you for that gift of the mercy to give us strength as we work our way through this life on earth. We thank you so much, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand as we continue in worship with one more uh, great hymn of the faith. Praise him, praise him.
God, we do praise you through our song this morning. God, we praise you through um, our countenance this morning. We praise you through the joy that exudes uh, through light that only you can provide, God. Um, may you be lifted up in this worship service this morning to receive honor and glory due only to your name. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John and, and Leah and Roland and Gay and Chris, appreciate all of you each week leading in worship. Well, over the summer, we're talking about the kingdom of God and what that really means, what it is, what it's like, what does Jesus teach about it, and how we are to live as citizens of this kingdom. Now, one of the most important things about living in the kingdom of God has to do with our priorities. So this Sunday, this sermon, I want to talk with us about our priorities. So I hope it's okay if I meddle a little bit. No, yeah, I heard that. That's okay, at least you're honest. (laughs) Let's talk about our priorities and what this really means for us as believers. How do we keep our priorities focused, first and foremost, on the way of Christ? Well, another parable gets at this very idea and this topic. Let's go to Matthew 13 once again. We're spending a lot of our summer in the Gospel of Matthew, especially here in chapter 13 where Jesus talks constantly about the kingdom of God and tells us parables about the kingdom. Matthew 13, verses 31 through 33. Small parable, big implications. Starting in verse 31, Matthew 13. Here's what Jesus said. Another parable He put before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Hmm. Let's pray together. God, we have an interesting little parable in front of us this morning. Help us to make sense of it, and to make sense of it in ways that uh, connect with us today and how we live each and every day, and how we prioritize life. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You have likely heard some of the sayings that I want to put on the screen here. Let's go ahead and go to that next slide. Can you fill in the blank with me? Everything is bigger, hotter in Texas. That, that will suffice. The judges will accept that answer. Um, where'd it go? Well... I'll keep going. The stars at night are big and bright. Here's another one. Go fill in the blank or go home. Go big or go home. There we go. We like, especially in Texas, but in our society in general, we like to do things big, don't we? With gusto. Nothing really wrong with that, by the way. But I want to talk about this today. What does it mean to be big? In fact, I I find it kind of funny sometimes. I'll have a friend or family member from out of state and we're usually driving around somewhere and they'll see these huge high school stadiums and they'll say man that's a high school set that looks like a pro stadium 
And they do. We do high school football big, don't we? Uh, yeah. And, and, and my friend or family member, member will say usually, well, James, why do y'all build such monstrosities like that? And I'll usually say, well, it's because these things are very important to us that we do them very big. And there it is. Did you hear it? It's so important to us that we do it big. That is generally accepted doctrine in Texas. That if something is important, then it must be made into something huge. That's why we want big houses and big trucks. And big schools. And big stadiums. My son said big sports cars. <laughs> I heard that. And big banks. And we want big kids who can brave big heat on big soccer fields. We can get duped into thinking that all of our priorities have to revolve around doing what is big. Now that may be generally acceptable in Texas and in our society, but Jesus may disagree with that. See, here's the deal. What if I were to tell you that small things Small people, small events can be just as powerful as the big things. See, the biblical narrative often takes everything that we think about linking importance to bigness, it takes that and turns it on its head. Let me give you some examples. God decided to start the promise of eternal salvation. The process of that, He started that with a nomad named Abram. God decided to take a small group of Jewish slaves in Egypt and make them the primary nation through whom He would do His salvation work. God chose a small runt of his family sheep herder to be a king. In the middle of Jewish exile, God saved a remnant. A baby born to a couple of no-name people from Nazareth was God incarnate. And remember, he was born in a place or lived in a place called Nazareth. And people said, what good can come from Nazareth? Almost every story in the Bible is about how God uses small people, small events, and small things and can take those people and things and turn them into earth-shattering processes. So instead of saying... If it's important to us, we'll do it big. Why not say if it's important to God, even though it may look measly, I will embrace it? Now, how does such a mind shift like that happen? How do we shift away from if it's big, it's important? How do we go from that to... I'm going to do the priorities of the kingdom of God, even though it may look small. Well, in this parable, Jesus gives us a few insights into how to shift our mind away from bigness to smallness. What are these insights? Here's the first one. First of all, there's more to the kingdom of God than meets the eye. In fact, please get this. God's work around us may not often appear to be spectacular. And that's okay. 
Even though God's work may at times not appear to be spectacular in your life, that does not mean that God's work is still is not a priority. See, sometimes the work of God in your life, in your church, it may look like this. Let's go to the next slide. Now that looks like a bunch of corn, doesn't it? Or something like that. These are mustard seeds. Now it looks big on a screen, but the actual seed, mustard seed, is one millimeter in diameter. One millimeter. But something really fantastic happens when you plant a mustard seed. This one millimeter seed can grow into an eight to ten foot tree. And even back in Jesus' day, some farmers didn't like mustard bushes or trees. Why? Because they would take over and invade the whole garden. Let me make that plain and practical. Just because you cannot necessarily see God's work around you and in you, that does not mean God isn't at work. And some of you may be discouraged today because you aren't seeing something happen that you want to happen or need to happen or God doesn't seem to be doing the spectacular in your life. And there are some of you who are discouraged because you feel hindered by things outside of your control, your mobility. I mean, let's be honest. Some of us suffer, suffer from what you all have told me is called AGE syndrome. Right? And you get discouraged about that. And you may say, well, God is, it, it can't work inside of me. God can't use me. God's not going to use me. Can we not rethink that? And how that mindset shapes our priorities? Let me put it like this. One person, one person can change everything. For instance, one person who plants a mustard seed of prayer can change our church. One person who plants a mustard seed of witness where you are your sphere of influence. That will change the trajectory of one lost person's life. Friends, the devil is going to lose the spiritual war that we're involved in right now. It may not seem like it, but he has already lost. So why not act like the devil has already lost the war? You don't have to be about the spectacular. You just have to be faithful. This is why Jesus said, if you simply have a mustard seed size faith in him, you will be able to say to that mountain over there, you move over here and the mountain will move from there to here. All it takes is one person, maybe doing small things. For instance, all it may take is one person mourning over their sin and repentant of that. All it takes is someone who's meek, who doesn't want all the attention, who turns the other cheek when everybody else is blaming them for everything that's wrong in the world. All it takes is one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness when everyone else is hungering and thirsting for the big things in life. Give me what's big. And the Christian says, no, I want the things of God, big or small. All it takes is one who turns to Christ for the purification of the heart. 
Instead of saying, look at all these big things that I've done. In fact, do you want to know what happens at the judgment? This is kind of scary if you think about it. But Jesus talks about it. At the time of the judgment, there will be people who say to Jesus, look at all that I've done for you. I collected all these canned goods for you, Lord. But what will Jesus say? I don't know who you are. Because when you didn't do it to the least of the the small ones, you didn't do it to me. All it takes is one. Don't ever think, friends, that you are unimportant insignificant or a trifle in the sight of God. You can set your entire life and all your priorities not on trying to be significant, being an influencer, all these big things that the world tells us we have to do today. You can set your entire life on the Lordship of Christ who takes what is seemingly insignificant and grows it just to how He wants it. In fact, let me tell you briefly what happens when you look at God's kingdom and when you look at yourself and you say, you know what? This God kingdom stuff is just small potatoes. I, I want to be some, a part of something big and, and something that really matters. And I, I, I've made progress past this God stuff. Let me tell you what happens when you forget the mustard seed, one thing that's going to happen is that you will fall prey to the devil's lies. And one of the biggest lies that Satan has is that he will tell you, you have to be big and important or you don't matter. That's a lie. That lie has been around a long time, by the way. In the Garden of Eden, The serpent essentially told Adam and Eve, you do not have to believe in this God nonsense. Eat from the fruit and you will be important. That was a lie. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, do you remember one of the chief temptations? Hey Jesus, jump off the temple. Show people how cool you are and how miraculous you do things. And, and, and let's make this into a great circus. Oh, I bet we could make some money on this. What did Jesus say? No. I'm not doing that. Another thing that will happen if you shift your priorities away from the kingdom of God and the mustard seed-sized faith you will begin to detach decision-making from dependence on God. You will begin to think, well, God is just not doing things on my timetable. Have you ever thought that? Never. Yeah, nobody, nobody in here has ever thought that. Or we begin to think, well, God is not doing this how I want it to be done. And so we begin to detach and we say, well, I'll figure this out myself. And then what happens? You start to reduce Jesus. You you start to relegate Him. He was just ancient history. I used to believe in Him, but that's all mystical nonsense. Now I've, I've got my priorities focused on that which is bigger and better. I'll do it myself. And then when we detach from Jesus and relegate Jesus, a a, a pretentiousness then begins to well up. And then when we are so enwrapped in our own pretentiousness, we will lose sight of what's right and what's wrong. In fact, if we become too pretentious, we disregard right and wrong altogether. The only measure of priorities at that point is what is useful. Did you catch that? How many people today don't do what's right because that is just not useful to them anymore? 
Do we do that? We're walking down a slippery slope when we begin to detach our decision making from dependence on God. When we get to a point of saying, I'll do all this myself, and we relegate Jesus, we become pretentious and arrogant in our own way, and we do what's useful for us instead of doing what's right. And I can hardly think of a better description for our society right now. We're doing what's useful, Pastor. We don't care about this Jesus stuff. We care for so much about supposedly what is useful to us and all the big and the bad stuff instead of the mustard seed faith. So where do you go with that? If you're walking down this slippery slope, let me encourage you with the second point of this message today. It's this. The second major thing inside that Jesus addresses in this parable, we heard it in Isaiah 40 just a moment ago, wait on the Lord. How many times do the biblical writers challenge us to wait on God? The most famous of all these biblical passages is Isaiah 40, 31. You heard it just a moment ago. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You may say, well, James, what does that really mean? How do I wait on the Lord? Especially when I want to do things my way or things are not happening in the timetable that I want and I want to go big or go home. How do I wait on the Lord? Does that mean I just have to sit around around twiddling my thumbs until God does something? That is not what waiting on the Lord means. In fact, waiting on the Lord doesn't mean you're waiting on something to happen. Waiting on the Lord means that God is already making something happen, but it may not be at your preferred pace. So as you wait in this process of God working and God working and God working, guess what happens? You in the waiting begin to grow. You in the waiting begin to mature. You in the waiting understand what it means to be faithful. Paul called it remaining steadfast. Waiting on the Lord does not mean God is not at work. It means God is at work. But instead of forcing your way, you stay with God. And here's why that's so important, especially in this parable. Jesus talks about how a one millimeter mustard seed grows into about a 10 foot tree. But you know, that's a process for that to happen, right? How many of you have ever tried to grow a garden, let's say, like tomatoes? That's what my grandparents used to grow. You couldn't get impatient with those things. How how ridiculous would it look if you were growing tomatoes and you planted them one day and then the next day you went out to them and said, all right, tomatoes, appear, pull. Would they grow for you? If you waved a magic wand, you will grow now. No? How ridiculous is it if your priorities every day is is about trying to force those tomatoes to grow? You're not going to get good tomatoes. Remember what we said a few weeks ago? You can't microwave the brisket. You put a brisket in a microwave, it's still brisket, but it ain't good. Is not the Christian life more about who we are and who we are becoming than what we can accomplish? What you do with your life needs to come not from you, but from Jesus who lives in you. 
And if you aren't anchored in Christ, you're not going to move with Christ. Jesus said it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean. It's what comes out. Who are you? In fact, there are probably some things in your life that you need to stick with instead of giving up on them, even though they may appear small. Why? Because those small things are the things of God and they'll grow. May not be on your timetable, but they'll grow. Because see, here's the deal. Once the kingdom begins to really blossom out and start branching out and start growing, what does Jesus say happens? It becomes a home. It becomes a place where life is rooted. It it, it becomes a place where the birds of the air, Jesus said, make their nest. Which, by the way, back in Jesus' time, that probably was a reference to Gentile people. Those ignoramuses out there. The lowlifes. They're going to be welcome into this kingdom and find a home here when the world out there has no home for them. Think of it this way. What would have happened if Paul had just given up on ministering to Gentiles? (laughs) What would happen if you give up on ministry that God has called you to do because it's too slow? It's too small. It's too difficult. What if Jesus' apostles had said, well, this guy is just a lunatic from Nazareth. Um, I think it would be better if we went into Jerusalem and had a violent uprising and revolution. What if they'd have said that? And what if Jesus Himself had just stuck with the huge crowds instead of focusing on twelve? And out of those twelve, focusing on three. Talk about small. Do you realize Jesus primarily invested in three people? But what happened? The book of Acts says they turned the world upside down. What about us? What about your priorities? Wouldn't it be weird for you to say to somebody tomorrow, you know what, at West Oak Woods, everything is smaller in Texas. Because God's work sometimes looks like that. But on God's timetable, it's growing. And it's going to flourish. And people who don't have a home are going to find a home. We can't force it, but as we wait on the Lord, it'll happen. You don't have to detach. You don't have to fall into Satan's lies. Wait on the Lord and renew your strength. Let's pray. God, thank You so much that You are the King of a kingdom that looks measly and small to a lot of people. but it's growing. It's thriving. It's a kingdom that's already won the war, even though Satan still wants to fight many battles. And so Lord, today I I pray that now as we enter into a time of decision making that Your Spirit would help us, nourish us, call us, to do Your will and to wait on You. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We now have a time of decision. I'm going to be down here at the front. This is a a time John's going to sing an invitation song here in just a minute. We'll stand and sing, and as we do, I invite you to come. If you have a public decision that you'd like to make, say, hey, Pastor James, I'd like to join the church. Or, Pastor, you're talking about this kingdom and, and... 
Jesus is the king of this kingdom. I want to be a part of his, I want to be under his auspices. I'm, I'm tired of trying to do everything my way. I need forgiveness of sin. And I want to be a part of this kingdom where I'm free to obey and to look like him and to grow and to experience his leadership in my heart. You can do that today. Perhaps you're convicted. You may be saying, well, I've made a profession of faith. I've come into this kingdom, but I want to follow Christ in baptism and that command that He's put upon, put upon us to symbolize what has happened in here outwardly as a witness. The old self is dead and gone, and Christ now lives within me. Whatever your decision may be, I invite you to come. Perhaps you have a more personal or private decision between you and God. This is a great time to just say, Father, what do you need me to do? What, what's your will for me? I'm open. I'm all ears. And you can do that now as well. Let's pray. and st- Let's stand together and pray together. And you respond as John leads us. have a seat where you are. I'm going to ask those who are uh, helping with the offering, go ahead and come to the front. And Cheryl is going to, let me get you a microphone, Cheryl, I forgot that. Um, Cheryl is going to be doing our deacon offertory prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you say in your word to let the little children come to you. They came this week. We thank you for the success of our VBS this week. We pray that these children will come to know you because of the seeds that were planted this week. May our tithes and offerings given in joy be multiplied for you, your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Alrighty, a few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, right when we're done here with uh, worship, I would invite um, those of you who can, please stick around for a few minutes because uh, we need to break down our BBS decorations. And the more people we have involved in that, the faster it's going to go. And Becky, I see that hand. Wow. Okay, so we have a local church here in Austin that wants to use these, and uh, we can donate them to uh, that church. So we need to break these down. Um, Kathy, where'd you go? There you are. Um, has a list of things that uh, we, we're saving some things for church use and, and donating the majority of it. But um, I think it would be best. Are we going to put the decorations in the foyer? Is that kind of the staging area? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's, that's correct. So uh, if you could help us um, break these decorations down, uh, the more the merrier and the more the faster. And that gets you to Father's Day lunch quicker too. Um, so we've got that. Also, um, I do want to tell you some good news as well. Our uh, lease with Chick-fil-A is signed. And um, I do want to let you know this, however. Um, we still <laughs> have been asked to uh, keep this sort of under our hats for a little while and not let it get too public because of um, some corporate things that uh, it, it's a competition thing, all right? They, they, uh, it's a business thing. We, we don't have much control over that. So just don't go to lunch and get on the table and say, hey, guess what our church is doing? I mean, you can do that if it's something about Jesus, but, uh, you know. I did see that uh, dads eat free at Chick-fil-A on Sunday today. Uh, that's not possible if Chick-fil-A is not open. Well, let's try. Oh. You have to bring your own chicken. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so that, uh, that has happened. Also, uh, this Wednesday night, we will have our Bible study and, and prayer meeting uh, this Wednesday, and uh, look forward to doing that. All right, I want to, uh, many of you know, um, Bob and Linda, but I want to introduce them to you. If y'all would come stand with me here. Bob and Linda Sarles um, have been uh, worshiping with us for uh, many months now, I think, but um, are here to officially say, hey, we want to be a part of the West Oakwoods family as members. And uh, this, is, this is really, really, really good. And, and by the way, if you're considering church membership, um, sometimes I think those words we may need to change those at some point. Like membership implies like I'm going to Costco today. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, so I, I'm thinking, I heard a term actually on the radio this morning that another church used. They called it covenant partnership. I really like that word. It's, you know, I'm, I'm entering into this family, uh, covenanting with them to do the, uh, the work of God. I'm not just a member. I'm a participant. I'm a partner in this. And so... Um, we certainly do welcome uh, uh, Linda and Bob with us, and I hope that you'll come on your way to come help with decorations to, uh, <laughs> to say hello to them and say welcome and to say I'm praying for you and I'm with you and welcome to the family, okay? One more thing. Yes, ma'am. Where are those located? Okay, if you have a VBS evaluation form that has been given to you, though, to you, please fill those out and give them to Shannon. Okay, all right. As soon as you can, which means by 1230. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, before next year's VBS. Yeah, before next year's VBS. That'd be great. All right, let's stand together. Let's pray. Thank you for the few extra minutes. Let me preach this morning. I'll give those back to you on Wednesday. Right? Okay. Lord, thank you so much for um, this beautiful day. And we now thank you that in worship uh, here this morning, you've spoken to us, you've led us. Bob and Linda have joined us officially, and we say thank you. And now lead us outside of these doors. And even though we may do 
what we consider small things, that we realize that these things grow. And help us to prioritize all of our lives around you and what you want for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.